So hello, uh, everyone, and welcome to the latest Arc Aging program webinar. As Gemma said, we are very pleased to welcome our guest speaker today, Professor Katie Featherstone. Katie is Professor of Sociology and Medicine at the University of West London. She is also the director of the Gallery Institute of Aging and Memory at the same university. And given that she must be a very busy woman, we are very pleased that she took some time to speak to us today. Katie will talk uh, to us for about 30 or 40 minutes about a topic related to one of her latest works, which is a monograph written alongside Andy Northcott called Wonder in the Words, an Ethnography of Hospital Care and its Consequences for People Living with Dementia. The monograph was published by Rutledge in 2020 and draws on five years of ethnographic research in acute wards in the UK, where Katie and Andy follow people with dementia through their admission and shadow hospital staff as they interact with patients and across shifts. It reveals the institutional and world cultures that inform the organization and delivery of everyday care for people living with dementia who require urgent and scheduled hospital care. If you haven't read the book yet, I'll repeat the title, Wonder in the Wars, an Ethnography of Hospital Care and its Consequences for People Living with Dementia. Go ahead and read it. It's an excellently written ethnographic work. And the only thing I will say now about the book, because later we will have a time for discussion, is the same thing I told Katie the first time we met. I worked for three years in social care in Northern Ireland, and I often thought that I would, it would be so interesting to carry out an ethnographic work in the place I worked in. And when I read Katie's book, things sounded surprisingly familiar in many ways. It felt to me as if Katie's sharp ethnographic eye was able to identify the dynamics that I, as a worker, belong to. I reinforced, but to some extent were invisible to us. So even if we are talking about completely different environments, I could see how intense the connection was and how relevant Katie's work was to understand my own workplace. So just enjoy the talk and uh, I am sure we will have uh, time for a lovely discussion afterwards so I can give you more comments, Katie. So I'm going to hand over to Katie because she's the one you're all here for. All yours, Katie. And thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's great to be here. And um, yeah, thanks, Ankel, for such a, a fabulous introduction. And I agree, we've already had some great discussions that I really hope we can develop on here. Um, it's also great to be invited by Gemma. Um, I'm a big fan of Gemma's work, really, the way that she can, she, she uses methods to get to what is really the undiscussable, that I think I'm, I really, really admire, and something that I've tried to get at a bit with my ethnography, but I don't think I've quite managed it the way she has. So yeah, so today I'm going to talk to you about wandering the wards. Um, this is, I suppose there are lots of ways that we could slice the story and the work that we've done over the last five years, but um, Alkel and I discussed that we'll actually we focus on the rules of the ward, because I think that's also something we can all relate to. Um, the, the rules of organisations are something we all feel all the time. But there's something very particular about the rules for people living with dementia in acute wards and the consequences. So I'm going to talk, um, talk to you about that today. And first, I'm going to give you some, some context, really, for really about, hold on, my mouse is my game, about dementia and the context in the hospital. So when we first started this work, um, we knew a lot about the um, the outcomes of people with dementia, but very little about the experiences. So this is really the background. We've seen a incredible rise in the number of people living with dementia within our acute wards. Um, at present, it's estimated between 25 and 50 percent of all hospital beds in the UK are occupied by someone living with dementia. And that's reflected internationally as well. They're there not because they're dementia, they're there because they've got an additional acute condition, typically a pre preventable but also a treatable condition. Typically pneumonia, sepsis, UTIs, fractures. So they should be going into our wards, being treated by expert care and returning home. However, this population has some of the worst outcomes and experiences. They have extremely high short-term mortality with almost a quarter of that population dying during their admission 
And if we compare two patients with the same admitting condition, the person with dementia will be at twice the risk of dying during their admission. So what is it about the hospital setting that is contributing this? Well, we know from a, I suppose, a couple of decades of inquiries and reports that tell us again and again about the poor experiences and poor outcomes of this population. This story is repeated and what they all tell us is something about the culture. They say it's something about the culture in hospitals that's contributing. And you know, I could pick a newspaper pretty much any day in the UK and I'll find one of these stories. Um, but what this body of reports and inquiries tell us, it tells a couple of some really, really important things. It tells us that something deeply systemic about the inequalities people living with dementia experience in the acute setting, but also that it seems incredibly resistant to change. We've known about it and are repeatedly told about these poor experiences and outcomes, but actually very little has changed. The mortality rates and the, um, uh, the experiences data tells us the same thing. They're pretty shocking. And one thing that we really thought when you start to look at that data is maybe there's something about the impacts of the hospital itself. We quite often see iatrogenic impacts um, viewed as um, medications going wrong or something with the actual treatment that actually is causing these poor outcomes. But what we're seeing increasingly and what our work shows is that sense of actually the hospital itself, the organisational culture, the delivery of care that is dangerous for people living with dementia and really impacts on um, the person, impacts on their dementia and also um, re real decline during an admission. So that's really what we wanted to, to focus on. What is it about that organisation and delivery of care? NHS response to this, these poor outcomes and experiences has been very um, kind of high level organisation, um, creating new types of wards. We have wards created for particular types of patients, so care of the elderly, rapid assessment, cognitive impairment wards. We have new environments, so um, signage and day rooms designed for kind of like an idealised kind of world of the 1950s. Uh, we have outsourcing of skills, so new, very small teams are created that have um, expertise or enhanced care. And we also have identification schemes, so putting butterflies and forget-me-nots at the bedside to identify a person who has that diagnosis. So it's very kind of high level organisational structures, but importantly, there's no evidence base supporting these interventions. They're very much a, an intervention that's seen as, a, as a, um, uh, a rapid response to a problem rather than really understanding what's going on. And of course, if we really want to um, change and support um, wards, we really need to understand their cultures, how they work in practice. Wards are highly resistant to change. And we've seen that from decades of interventions trying to, to change the organisation and delivery of care. And we feel what we need to do is really look at work as done rather than work as imagined by the NHS, by organisational managers. So that's what we did. So we, um, we have obtained um, three lots of funding from um, NIHR, which is Department of Health and Social Care funding, looking at different aspects of hospital care. Our first looked at resistance and refusal of care, which is really a phenomenon that families and ward staff thought was a, a real issue for them. And to follow up, we looked at continence care, something that emerged from the first study as a really important topic, but really also something that was very invisible and unexamined. And then we're moving on now to our, our next study, looking at in more detail in restraints and restrictive practices in care. I'm gonna report on these first two, resistance and refusal and continence care. So where I was first thinking about the importance of actually we need ethnography and hospital ethnography, um, I look back on what there was in the literature 
and we have an incredible history of sociological and anthropological texts really showing us the, the, um, the cultures of hospital wards. But one thing struck me is that there's quite a massive gap. We have these amazing um, ethnographies of the 1950s and 60s, and then there's a huge gap. And I think I was quite naive at the time. I didn't really think about why that might be, but um, it turned out that actually it's really hard to get into NHS hospitals <laughs> and do ethnography. <laughs> so <laughs> that was a little lesson. I, I, um, I got um, once I started to try and get um, ethics and um, ethical approval to do this work. Um, but this body of work has been really, really important to look at the, the history of the wards and the continuity of uh, the organisation and delivery of care. And what we found overall is that actually our findings really reflected some of the key organisational um, features of these wards in the 1950s. Um, and also some of the consequences also were very similar. So there's a massive continuity in the world of the ward. So what do we do? Well, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the, about the methods other than to say that we did classic hospital ethnography. Um, we involve people in with dementia and um, their families in our research, in the design as co-applicants, in the research governance and in the development of our research. Um, we carried out field work in hospitals across England and Wales, which really tried to work on getting very average hospitals and wards, ones that were seen as good quality. We didn't go into any, any that were seen as being special measures or having any problems. Um, and we were in hospital wards for over a year, carrying out uh, data collection um, uh, throughout shifts, day, day shifts, night shifts and all our research is approved by NHS ethics committees. So the ward, well, I think one thing that I found from all of those um, classic ethnographies is that they all describe the ward as a small society, both as separate from everyday life, but also reflecting wider society and wider cultural norms. And that's really what we found as well. But importantly, this had consequences for people living with dementia. People were really cut adrift on these little islands within the wards. They were viewed as a person defined essentially by their condition, existing in isolation, and also as if they were unaffected by the wider organisation and delivery of care within those wards. They were also deeply affected by the, um, the wider social understandings of dementia that really did um, other them as, as people who had a very particular condition and had less agency. I'll explore that in the paper. So understanding the rules. Um, and Carl and I decided that I'd talk about the rules because I think that is something we can all relate to. Every time we walk into an institution, we feel that sense of the war, a sense of what are the rules here? How do we behave here? What's the expectations within the setting? Whether it's a school, a university, a hospital, any institution, we feel that as we walk through the doors. And of course, everyone and all patients in a hospital are expected to learn the rules of these institutions. To learn to conform to the rules, restrictions and freedoms. As Ross and Eddie note in their classic ethnography, which is actually one of my, my very favourites, if a patient is new on the ward, he must be taught the customary behaviours and ordering of relationships. And we've actually found in the wards that patients were often explicit in asking um, staff about the rules, what they could do, how to behave here. And we found those rules were there as well. Every time we, we walk through those the, the doors into the wards we felt every time afresh what are the rules here even though we've been into many many wards before we still felt that sense of uneasiness that sense of not belonging a nagging sense of doubt that kind of permission where can we go can we go here who can we talk are we allowed in here we felt that every time even though we've been to, to many wards previously 
So what are the rules? Well, we found that there were many, many rules, powerfully felt and um, observed by, for nurses, but also for patients. And I'm gonna focus here on just some of the rules that we identified for people living with dementia. Although these right rules apply to all patients, what we found overall was a real explicit reinforcement and emphasis for people living with dementia within these rules. There was a, also a very limited range of responses that were viewed as acceptable and in accordance with these rules. And also very little flexibility. While other people might be given leeway within these wards for a person with dementia, there was very limited flexibility in what they were able to do. And if they strayed out of that, we saw an increased tightening and rigidity of care and practices around them, which really reflected those kind of 1950s ethnographies, which talked an awful lot about permissions, but also privileges. Some people must ask permission, some people are given privileges within these wards. And we can see here, so this is quite a dense um, bit of data, but this is some data from my first day ever in a hospital ward. And the healthcare assistant wakes a, a patient for observation medication. And as she does this, a young man, he walks between us, um, he's from a low dependency bed, and um, he walks past us and he's just wearing his underpants. He's holding his wash bag and pushing um, an IV um, drip, um, mobile drip along the corridor. And um, at the same time, Kathleen is getting up from her bedside chair. Kathleen's living with dementia. And she walks over, she, she, she leaves the bedside and she starts to, to slowly walk away. At this, the healthcare assistant calls over to her, where are you off to? She responds, she's heading to the toilet and the healthcare assistant is relieved. Oh, I thought you were going to escape. She goes over and helps her to reach the walking frame and stands behind her. She closely shadows her um, all the way to the bathroom and back. As a young man from the bay and his underpants, uh, the ward walks back to the bathroom, still in just his underpants, the healthcare assistant gives me a look. So it's just a, my kind of first sense of actually being different rules for different people within these ward settings. Very different rules. So rule one, understand you are in hospital. We found that that was the key phrase that ward staff at all levels, all hospital staff would repeat to a person living with dementia within these wards. There was a really highly rigid and re very repetitive repertoire of Talk phrases and performative work at the bedside. This was also all done in that special tone of voice, as Goffman calls it, of the total institution. The focus on communicating with people living with dementia was always about locating and reorientating them within the institution with extremely simplified instructions. Um, often in, but well, always in that specific tone. Either you're in hospital, sit, sit in the chair, sit down, but also warnings about risk. The potential of what might happen if you stray from these, um, these rules. Um, you will have a, you know, there's also kind of, you will have a fall, you will be at risk, um, but also, repetitions of what had happened to them. So reorientating to people to um, what had happened to them and where they were. And as you can imagine, that was often quite distressing for people living with dementia who were there with an acute condition. condition. Rule two, you must not wander. Um, as researchers, we were allowed to wander the wards. But for any other older person and a person living with dementia to be away from the bedside was always described as wandering uh, or um, 
the, having the potential to be to abscond or um, absconding the ward and the risk, a risk of falling. This sort of behaviour, as in just walking away from the bedside, could lead to staff having a lot of anxiety and a lot of repetitions about why the person should return. Instructions to stay in bed or stay at the bedside were really, really common. These typically contained a real powerful sense of urgency and really reflected a lot of anxiety of staff about a person leaving the bedside. Repeated warnings emphasising risk, danger and the con potential consequences. Whereas other people like the young man could, could wander as well. Communication needs to be done through institutionally recognised ways. There was a really limited way in which people of intervention were able to communicate in ways that were actually picked up and responded to by staff. This focused on people giving very clear verbal instructions of their need, which might be quite difficult for the person with dementia, particularly with that additional acute condition. So that need to really emphasize that, that verbal clear communication to a member of staff, but also the use of the, um, the personal buzzer or alarm at the bedside. To do anything other, was a risk of being really um, not visible towards staff at all. It wasn't institutionally recognised um, communication. So that embodied communication uh, that people um, with living with dementia uh, do use, but also many people with an acute condition who find difficulty communication to communicate will use that embodied language of looking uncomfortable, distressed, also potentially repetitive body language, but also that kind of becoming silent and withdrawn. That could be very hard for staff to see. It had to be that institutional, um, appropriate ways of communicating. Care must fit the timetable. So urgent care or any urgency in need, and we saw this particularly around continence care, could be seen as something that was very disruptive to the organisation of the ward and something that was really to be discouraged. Um, staff had a, a massive fear of um, falling behind. Um, the fear of falling behind was present in all those wards and during every shift. And it could also increase during the shift as well. We found there were, there were points in every shift where we see those moments when a team would start to feel that fear and it become very real for them and a real sense of urgency. If patients wanted, people in dementia wanted urgent care during those points, that could really, be very difficult for staff to cope with and what you'd find instead would be about um, bargaining um, with patients to um, to um, conform to the timetable and the routine of care with anything outside of that seeing as um, a potential source of disruption and we saw that a lot with continence care. People's urgent care needs for continence care to go to the bathroom was often seen as a disruption, particularly at those points where it started to become, um, the fear got um, greater for staff about falling behind. Continence care could be something that could be really deprioritized. All of this was really about um, emphasizing the institutional expectations, the very real, but also the deeply felt assumptions about how care must be delivered to meet the expectations of the institution of the timetable. Everybody was caught in this rule. We have to change you. We have to do this was something that staff often said. They felt it too. You must have no personal possessions at the bedside. While other people, for example, the man in his underpants can have his toilet, toiletries and actually had a bed with lots of things around him. For people living with dementia, this was stripped away. It was often done and placed in um, 
in bedside lockers, often locked and inaccessible, often done for safety reasons or to keep things, you know, keep things, um, can, things there. But this harks back to a very longer um, process of um, practice within the acute ward of stripping, where the person is stripped. They're stripped of their things, but also of their identity. And they're placed in hospital issue gowns or pajamas and socks. We found there were lots of um, resources within these wards. As I said earlier about the 1950s um, uh, decor to make them dementia friendly. However, what we found was actually a lot of these, well, the majority of these environments were um, very neat and tidy to the extent that actually they needed to be preserved as perfect resources. The, the rooms where nobody went into or used, or the resources that were packed away in cupboards, beautifully collected, but never given to a person. You must follow etiquette and bodily discipline. This could often go beyond whether a person, for example, wasn't eating a meal or, but really about how um, staff asserting control over how they ate it. For example, someone could be eating quite, be quite able to eat themselves the meal, but if they were um, a little bit um, messy or that was seen as, as the food was spreading elsewhere, that was something staff found very difficult. And, and that was very much disciplined around, actually, we need to maintain order and that ability to eat a meal themselves was taken away from that privilege was, was taken away and the person would be um, seen as a feeder and would need to be um, fed their meal by staff. So I don't know whether you've ever thought about eating a meal in um, a hospital bed or eating a meal in bed, eating soup, from a bowl in bed with a dessert spoon. Um, that was something that was routinely expected of people living with dementia and older people within all these wards. Um, messiness is going to happen, but that was something that was really seen as something to be, that wasn't, um, wasn't um, something that was um, acceptable within these wards. It really triggered things around the correct order, the, the cleanliness of the ward, the cleanliness of the person. And I'll just give you this example as well of, of just, just, just one of, of um, what happens around um, meal times and how this can, can have an impact. If someone wants, doesn't want to eat and is very clearly able to say why they don't want to eat the meal, this can really trigger staff's assessment of the person's capacity. So all of these things can add up to real sense of, does that person have capacity? Are they able to make decisions? And these can all mean that those decisions are taken away from them. So, why are understanding the rules of these wards important? Well, they help us to understand the recogn recognition and understandings of dementia within these wards, how staff make sense of people living dementia and their care needs. Staff across these wards at all levels saw dementia as a cognitive deficit that required continual orientation, verbal cues and compulsive repetition to remind them of the behavioural norms of the institution. When a person emphasised their wishes, rejected the timetable or had an urgent care need outside of that timetabled order, it was viewed as particularly problematic in the moment, but it could also become a bigger focus of concern for staff over time if that continued. It could be recognised as a feature of the person's dementia and inability to understand the context and rationale of care. At the same time as having that kind of their, their um, seen as um, a feature of the person's dementia, 
it could also be at the same time interpreted as willful. A rejection of the ward timetables, a rejection of the order of the ward. So they, and they, you could see those occurring simultaneously as well, which, you know, is quite a difficult place for that person to be. <laughs> so this also further reinforced understandings of the condition with, um, within the ward, the way the ward team started to, to understand or make sense of dementia with um, this reinforced those um, lay understandings. And also that for a group that don't follow these rules, actually they don't belong here. And we heard that again and again, it's actually staff saying, feeling very sorry for the people living with dementia within wards, but going, but you know, they just don't belong here. They need to be somewhere else. So if you don't fit the rules, you don't belong. But there was never a sense that actually maybe we could change the rules for this major population. But of course, there were also significant rules and restrictions for staff. And I'm not going to go into all the details of those, that's a whole other paper, but I think the key thing here is care work, caring was highly restrictive and restricted. So conversations or listening to patients or spending time with a person with dementia was really viewed as something that was outside the norm and wasn't work. Um, that kind of work was only formally prescribed and carried out by specialist care workers, typically dementia care workers, meaningful activity workers, but they were typically a very, very tiny team, a highly skilled team, but very tiny within massive institutions. So of course they could only ever um, carry out that work for a very small number of people within those wards. Um, but what we found was that um, if we saw, and we did see uh, regularly, really high quality um, interactional work, staff spending time with patients, what we found is that other staff would invoke the rules. They would say, what are you doing? That's not what we do here. Aren't, aren't you working today? So it would be really stamped down on. So those rules were enforced very, very um, closely by the team. We also saw the tightening of the timetables. So I think this is, again, it goes back to those 1950s um, ethnographies, particularly Roth and Eddy. Of what you'd see is actually, as these rules became, um, were um, needed to be enforced, what you got was a tightening of the timetables and other things dropped from the list. So we saw, as, as I said earlier, things like continence care would drop from the list of essential care and other things would be a priority. And I just want to give you this example of how, how the rules become really enforced for people with dementia. So this is a room where everybody is sitting in a chair and the chairs are all alarmed. This is done to um, monitor movement and um, is to alert busy staff that a person with dementia might be standing at a risk of falling. So it's, it's um, a restrictive practice that is seen as a safety procedure. Um, but what I start to realize is that they're highly sensitive monitors that actually they're going off again and again. And all you have to do, I don't know whether, whether you, how you've been during this presentation, be moved a little bit in your seat, just a slight wiggle and the alarm will go off. And it was a massive blaring. And this would happen again and again, just a little move. But the response to this from the staff, I think for me was, was something that I really picked up on is, she explains you're sitting on the pad and if you wiggle, it will go off and it goes off. He, he pleads with her to turn it off. I will try, but I can't promise anything. She resets the alarm and leaves. So on one level, this is done for safety, 
but it's also highly distressive, dis dis distressing and disturbing for people, the patients here. Rather than turn it off, it's seen as actually this is a rule, this is something that must be complied with. And actually, this man is now expected not just to sit in the chair, but to sit in the chair precisely to not move. So what we saw in terms of the enforcement of rules was this containment restriction and restraint. To keep to the order of the ward, to keep to the organisation and timetables, but also to keep to the, the um, to enforce the rules, containment restriction and restraint were really common within all of these wards and was a key feature of care. The raising of the bedside rails and bars, tucking bed sheets tightly around the person, um, clinical technologies that could be repurposed, such as the, um, the chair alarms and tightly secured medical equipment. Um, they could all be used to contain people a bed in the bedside. We also saw continence care used in that way as well, um, pad cultures, and also one-to-one -one care. So you can see these have consequences. And I know I'm running out of time, Anne Kel, so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up here. But I think something that was really important for us was this distress was really seen by staff as a feature of the person's dementia. But actually, as um, Men Menzies Lift pointed out in her beautiful ethnography of the 1960s, perhaps normal behaviour in a hospital setting would likely to include a good deal of expression of distress and process, protest, a normal reaction to an abnormal setting. And I'm going to end it there, but just to say um, that we are also doing a, a lot of work to use this, um, our findings to improve care, working with ward teams to support them in understanding their cultures and how they might change them. Um, we've also got funding to look in more detail at restrictive practice. It's a really common feature of care, but something that nobody's really looked at in detail. And we really need to do that if we understand how, how we can properly support people with dementia in the wards, but also support the staff caring for them. And as Ankle said, the book is available and it's also um, open access, so it's totally free to download. Thank you. Thanks, Ankel. I'll shall I stop sharing. Thank you, uh, Katie. That has been absolutely fascinating. And <clears throat> can you hear me? Yeah. All right. I'm so I, I think I'm going to, I, I had a few questions ready, but I think I'm going to catch up with what you said at the end, because I see also a comment here in the chat from Jane, who says, that alarm sounds like torture for anyone, never mind someone who might be sensitive to sensory input. And a feature of your book is that the rules that you describe that are the rules of the world sound like torture for anyone. Never mind uh, your your physical condition. I also typed down here to remember something you said when you were talking about uh, the rule of wandering, mm. and you said uh, this was a rule for an older person and a person living with dementia. Yeah. So the, the first question I'm going to ask you is a bit more theoretical. Then I'm going to ask you a more practical one, but this one will be more theoretical because. Reading your book, you can see how you uh, how you are able to describe how dementia is often a simple label that is constructed in the words through the confusion of old age with dementia. You even give an example of a, of a younger man who has Alzheimer's disease, and he's not perceived by the world staff as having mm -hmm. dementia. They, they tell him, no, you cannot have it. You, you don't have them. And he says, yes, I do. And that affects his care. So um, I have here a, a quote from your book, which says, the recognition and attribution of dementia were typically tacit, 
often made at the bedside without the requirement of a formal diagnosis or the recognition of the potential impact of their acute admitting condition on their present cognitive and physical functioning, which is something that I always thought about when I, when I, I interviewed recently older people and they told me experiences with people who had Alzheimer's. And they said, oh, they kept telling me about these tests, you know, and you describe this test that happens in the bedside. Who is the prime minister? Who is, I remember in March, 2019, I met a person, we were listening to the radio. This was, Brexit was all over the place. And this person asked me, what is this Brexit thing? You know, things happen. You don't know yeah. exactly what people know, what people don't know. So uh, what I find fascinating and complicated of your ethnography is that you describe how in the words, the label having dementia that affects mm -hmm. the treatment of patients is shared by people that have a biological disease and people who might not have it, who mm -hmm. only has an informal diagnosis that was made yeah. there by people who might not be qualified to, mm -hmm. to do it. So uh, can you tell us a bit more about this? I think that was fascinating from your book, this confusion between old mm -hmm. age and, and dementia in the words. Thanks, Ankel. And I, and I agree. I think there's, there's so much more work to be done on that. I think I've just scratched, scratched the surface on looking at diagnosis, classification, attribution. I think there's so much going on that it's just been black boxed. Uh, what we're seeing now is um, in hospitals, uh, well, we, well, I think policy wise, we've got a massive drive to diagnose dementia. Hospitals are uh, given targets. Uh, they're judged on how many people they diagnose. Um, but what this is, these sorts of policy drivers are then turning into something else. So what you're finding is diagnosis and screening is done by non-experts who have these lay understandings and this kind of shared understandings within the hospital setting of how um, what dementia is, you know, a very, very lay understanding. Um, there's very little um, dementia training or uh, expert support for um, adult nursing, for senior um, non-dementia non specialist staff to really have a clear sense of what that diagnosis is and what it means. Um, and I think what we, since the book, I've been doing some more work on diagnosis. I've got, a, I've got an amazing um, grant application, which totally failed, it bombed because I think almost I just put too much in it because there's too much going on. But one thing I have discovered is that in the acute setting, we've got massive diagnosis of dementia within that setting. When an older person is also has an additional acute condition. So we just don't know the interaction of those, but it, you know, it, it but what, what we do know is a lot of um, misdiagnosis within that setting. We know certain groups are more likely to be diagnosed, um, but actually, yeah, they might, they might not have dementia. And also, once they're diagnosed in the acute setting, they may not have a follow-up. And we find these things like um, stickers over the bedside, which would be fine. It's, they're there to uh, help busy staff see the person with dementia. But if that busy person, member of staff, doesn't understand dementia or how to care for someone, then you're just reinforcing that stigmatizing of the person, the condition, the othering. So I have real problems with those sorts of technologies that are yeah. just done because people think it's a good idea, but there's no evidence. And we, you know, <laughs> it's something that it's, I think for older people, it seemed like it's more acceptable just to do these things. But actually, if it was another ser serious, um, uh, neurological deteriorate, you know, significant condition, we would not put a label over a bedside. We no. see it as something that yeah. was uh, was significant. So I think there's so much going on there, ankle. Sorry, <laughs> my long my long response, yeah. but can, can I, I it's a fascinating for, area. Can I interrupt for a second? Because I'm looking at the time and I, I want to make yeah. sure that you answer the questions in the chat there. There's yeah. a good question. Sorry, I'll, I'll start with, I'll, I'll try for shorter, shorter responses. So there was one, um, here, let me just open it so it's big. Um, from Paul Murphy. Hi, Katie. Thanks for a very interesting presentation, which chimes with my own research on simulation-based training on HCP stroke patient interactions. 
you cited a number of studies in the 1950s. I wonder if you've looked at more recent sociology of emotion, such as Hostile's work on feeling rules. Hostile's work is on emotional labor, principally in the airline industry, but it could well relate to rules-based organization in the healthcare context. Yeah, absolutely, Paul. Yeah, brilliant. I. I have touched on that, but I haven't read it enough to really respond. But I think you're right in that the key thing is these rules institutionally, there seems to be something across across them about, yeah, the I think in the acute ward, um, emotional work was really devalued and not seen as something we do here. And I, I found that quite interesting. And interesting. we need to do more work on that. So the other question then that I picked out here is from uh, Jane Lucea. Jane is the PI of that Dementia Fiction Project, you know, that I've been talking oh, yeah. about. Um, Brilliant. When, yeah, uh, and she, of course, is asking one of, her <laughs> one of her melting questions, brain melting questions, as we call them in Northern Ireland, about linguistics. She says Goffman's ob observation on the tone of voice of the total institution is really interesting. I wonder, as a linguist, if any research in speech sounds has been done to characterize what this is in phonological terms. Oh, I love that. I think we need to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is quite, you know, there's something about trying to describe these things that you're witnessing. And I try to make sure that I'm, I'm getting all the senses and everything, but it's very, very difficult. But I think we all know what it means. But you're right, finding the description to get that. One thing I find with the institutional voice is that it is very learnt. You can, I can, you can see a senior member of staff going in towards, going up to a person, going, you are in hospital. And then you see everybody start to use that. It kind of it, it kind of has a contagion as well. The tone and the words become something that then is this is what we do here. Yeah. And it really starts to become that's how we talk to people here. But I think there's an awful lot to be done on that tone. Love it. Back to you, Ankel. Okay, no, well then I will ask you now the, the, the methodological question that as an early career researcher I'm yeah. I'm interested in because you um, um, reading your book is, is very easy to notice how you can see things that nobody else in the world can see, you know, and, and you mentioned a couple of times that your, your position within the world is a position of privilege because the world staff is absorbed by their tasks and their rules and, you know, they, they are demanded many things by the organization of the hospital and as you said, those implicit rules that are generated and we don't know exactly how, uh, so they are unable to see the big picture. So you have the privilege of this external ethnographic guy, and this is great because you can see things that are going on that are invisible to, to those involved in them. But the problem is that you need to be honest, you know, and your book is brutally honest and sometimes extremely harsh about what you see and reports of what you witness often show the practices in the world in a very negative light, often those behaviors that are identified as behaviors of people with dementia are triggered by the rules and the behavior mm -hmm. of the staff. Uh, so your book is an excellent resource for hospitals because you provide an external eye, but at the same time, it can be difficult to digest mm -hmm. for those involved in it, you know? So can you tell us more about how you deal with this as a researcher, you know, from an ethical perspective? The need to be honest. Yeah, and yeah I, think, I think you're right, Uncle. It's a really tricky place to be. Um, because absolutely in the wards, I have to, I'm reporting what's happening. I'm observing everything. Um, I think a key thing about the actual data collection is I'm very with the team. I try to work with them. I shadow them. It's about getting to know them as well as the, the people who've been dementia within the wards. Um, it's about asking them why they're doing it, what the constraints are. Um, for me, the overarching approach is if we if we want to improve care for people with dementia we absolutely have to improve life in the ward for staff we have to improve experiences of work everybody i spoke to in terms of the individual member of staff all wanted to do things differently they all felt frustrated they were all exhausted yeah. and yeah. 
that's something I really wanted to, to capture is that sense of actually they are very trapped too. And I think the, you know, the that kind of early slide of the um, I showed of the, you know, the culture of the ward with the matron and everybody around, you know, honestly, those 1950s, the organisation and delivery of wards is so 1950s. There might be endless tech in our hospitals, but the organisation is very, very so resistant to change and we have to tackle that so during the field work i always make sure i share findings people can look at my field notes i we discuss them um feeding back to people is important but i think the you're right i'm always worried people are going to feel i'm negative about nursing and healthcare assistant and hospital care i'm not I'm here to go, actually, we need to shine a light so we can really help people to improve. Rather, rather than pretending everything's rosy, we have yeah. to look at what's happening now. But um, I'd say occasionally I will just tweak some of the slides for particular audiences because nobody wants things to be completely just thrown at them, particularly around the kind of wider things around some of the inquiries. I perhaps, while I'll be clear on my findings, perhaps some of the background things around inquiries I might be a little bit more um, gentle on with particular audiences. But I have to say, all in all, when I, I present an awful lot to nurses, to healthcare assistants, to um, hospitals, um, and they, they recognise what I say, they feel, and also they feel heard, they feel that this reflects the ward so that for me is is so important yeah. so it's it's all it is a balance and it is tricky because you're between mm. lots of worlds as an ethnographer sure. yeah sure thanks for that I, I don't know if there's anyone who wants to ask a question uh, i can ask you another one but if someone wants to participate they can if you, if you raise your raise hand, hand you can... and they can participate i can i can allow you to speak then Oh, it's coming through in the chat there. Sarah is saying that she's finding the tone of voice discussion so interesting. This is always what happens with Dr. Lucaya. You end up with this really interesting <laughs> new question um, around the ward and care settings and materialities too. Mm. Oh yeah, um, uniforms yeah. and latex gloves. That's such a good point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, th I think that's something that I think that, the ward is so, there's so much going on. I mean, it's, it is a sensory overload when you go into a ward. It's, it's bewildering and there's so much going on. And I think every ethnography, we're, we're kind of taking it another level down. We can, we can see different things. So in September, we head back into the wards to look particularly at restricted practice. So I think there we might find more around the materiality um that i think we can we can bring into play and also i think things like tone of voice as well might become more important there i think a lot of that like the language that, that we've talked about today is is quite coercive uh is you know so it's about I, so I think that's also things that we'll start to drill down and go actually yes we've seen restricted practice in the previous studies now we need to perhaps think about a bit more about actually how it manifests and what the the, the detailed texture of all of that yeah. and why that was something that I, I found as well fascinating when reading your book because a lot of what i read uh, i i i see it from my experience working in mm. social care and we were very warned about restrictive practices because there are legal consequences to mm. restrictive practice and, and uh, even I was told about the parents of one, one young boy that uh, was a, a resident in my place that when he goes home, she sometimes has this out, outbursts of uh, anger. They cannot restrict him, they cannot touch him. That's yeah. not, you know, you cannot do that. And you describe this putting things in the way of people so they cannot, mm. they cannot live the bed. That, that must be legally at least a gray area. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one thing that we are really clear of in the research is that everything that we report is is normal practice within these wards. We all the data that we have is there's nothing exceptional there. There's nothing there that we would go that stands out as unusual practice and shocking practice. Everything is is reflects. Um, 
the organisation and delivery of care that we've seen across the wards and across time. You know, it hasn't, hasn't really changed at all. But you're right, I think there's, there's it is a very tricky line. And I yeah. think there's, when with the restricted practice study, we're bringing in a lot more kind of socio-legal um, colleagues to really think about that yeah. as well, and more philosophical colleagues as well, to really start mm -hmm. to unpack that. But also, again, with that, we're not going to be blaming individual staff or teams this is systemic yeah yeah so i think that's i think that's quite often why people have shied away from topics like restricted practice but when it's systemic you have to just go we have to shine a light on it and go this is what's happening and actually yeah. be really deliver that detailed rigorous research that is actually lacking nobody's nobody's done it before yeah. so i think that's the that's the kind of where where i'm at so it's trying to do that that work but yeah it is it it, it is on that that line but yes, every yes, time yes, it's sure. about yeah did you mind if i ask you just one last thing before yeah. before we go <laughs> um just you you mentioned it at the beginning about belonging that uh, we need a cultural shift in the world because uh, people with dementia is perceived not to belong to the world mm. and you you offer a lot of examples in your book even though they are probably mm. a So they, there's a sort of discrepancy there. Yeah. The population of the words and the culture of yeah. the words, which is a source of conflict. How did you yeah. interpret that? Why did you think that happened? Yeah, you know, I, it, it's, it's an endless fascination to me, Ankle, because you're right, this, this population of being in our acute wards for, you know, in that level for at least a decade and they're not going away, they're growing. Um, but absolutely at ward level, it's very much, they don't belong here. They don't belong in this ward. There should be another place they should be going to. And that's also an NHS response. As you've seen with those um, other, other wards, we get kind of new types of wards to put them into. You know, and even when I first started, I was get, I, I remember before I went into wards or started working, I met a specialist nurse and went, oh, so you're, you've got a specialist ward, have you? And she went, no, Katie, they're everywhere. We need to. <laughs> So, um, but I think these organisational approaches of we classify older people by condition, by age, by frailty, by is a way for the NHS to organise, but it doesn't yeah. support anybody, it just says there's somewhere else they belong, but actually mm -hmm. they don't, they belong in acute wards where they need that specialist care. And actually, if they're sidelined to those care of the elderly wards, then they don't get the specialist care because you find that quite often cardiologists won't go to those or that specialist won't go into that ward because they don't have beds there. Or so it can it can absolutely it can it can increase the inequalities for that population. Yeah, sure. Yeah. OK, it's, it's 12 o'clock and I think our speaker and I'm, I'm sure our speaker is a very busy woman. So. Uh, I'll probably let everybody go because uh, we already did one hour. Um, before I let you go, I will remind you that this is the first of a series of webinars of the Arc Aging program um, called Next Generation Thinking in Research on Aging. We will have Bobby Duffy at 10 a.m. on the 14th of September. So just check regularly your email and the Arc newsletter to stay up to date with our webinar series. And again, Katie, thank you so much for the time you've given us today and for this fascinating talk and this fascinating topic. And I will tell everybody again. <laughs>